Good evening. Um, I'd like to call to order the Gladstone Planning Commission meeting on Tuesday, April 19th at 6.30 p.m. Tammy, could you please do a roll call? Commissioner Langston? Present. Commissioner Milch? Here. Commissioner Labonte? Present. Commissioner Mercero? Here. Commissioner Volbada? Here. Chair Smith? Present. I'd like everyone to stand to pledge allegiance, please. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, whoops, sorry about that. Um, would someone uh, like to make a motion to approve the February 15th uh, meeting minutes? I move approval of the minutes of February 15th. I'll second. I second. Okay. Meeting minutes have been approved. Um, let's do, let's, um, Let's do a roll call. Okay. Okay. Uh, Commissioner Langston. Yes. Commissioner Milch. Yes. Commissioner Labonte. Yes. Commissioner Mercero. Yes. Commissioner Volbada. Yes. Chair Smith. Yes. Okay. Um, could we move forward with the monthly planning report, Joy? I see in your packet that you have both February and March. So we are going to start with the February monthly planning report. Um, we had two individuals come to the county lobby to receive planning services in person. We had uh, 67 phone calls and emails. Uh, we had four building permits with land use review and we had one administrative decision. In addition, you guys considered and approved the Gladstone Public Library design review application. And that application has gone through the appeal period. And so your decision is final. Thank you. The land use compatibility statement for Tom's auto sales was the administrative permit. Um, and the building permits uh, you can see on the second page there. Um, there's a new permitting software system with the county. And so there are times where we see plans multiple times and they can change between iterations. And so um, when you see a description of revised plans, that means that I reviewed the plans again to ensure that the planning and zoning regulations were still compliant with the proposal for the building permit. Um, I have a question regarding the 420 Portland Avenue. Which business is that on Portland Avenue? Um, the... It's for the commercial alteration. I don't remember off the top of my head. Okay. Thank you, I, I can look it up. Go ahead. In March, we had the one member of the public come to the counter. We had approximately 52 phone calls and emails. We had six building permits with land use review and one administrative um, decision. As you know, you had a joint session with the city council. Um, that was a work session on the housing code amendments and no land use action was taken during that March meeting. Chair Smith, yes. 420 Portland Avenue is the card room. Okay, do we know what commercial alteration they're wanting to do? I believe it was the outside oh, where area they have that they put in. Okay. They got the proper permits to do that. Wonderful, thank you. 
they applied for a building permit, they will need land use review for an alteration of the commercial use. And so um, they have to have a design review uh, with you all to make that final. So that is, is continually going through the process. I have communicated with them and I believe that Sean has as well. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for bringing that up. Sure. There was a sign permit for the uh, Webster Road, the 18,000 Webster Road project that went through the authorization of similar use for um, the housing authority of Clackamas County. And so they, they are replacing the sign in the same location um, with a new sign. And you will see the, the building permits with land use review on the second page. And we are here tonight for the Gladstone Middle Housing Zoning Code Amendments public hearing. If everyone is ready, I will. Um, I'd like to open the public hearing on amendments to housing in Chapter 17 of the Gladstone Municipal Code planning file TXT 202201. I'm calling it to order. The proposed amendments are intended to bring the code into compliance with House Bill 2001. Um, the order of business we will follow in conducting this hearing will be presentation of staff report, entry of correspondence into the record, public testimony, additional staff comments, questions from the commission. We will then um, make a motion to close the hearing with no further te uh, testimony from the audience and then discussion by the commission and a decision. Do we have anyone lined up for any testimony, Tammy? We have not received anyone asking to speak tonight. Okay, um, I'll go ahead and read this anyway. Any interested person may present testimony concerning the proposed amendments. The public hearing is your opportunity to comment on the proposal before the city makes a decision. We want to hear what you have to say and, so, and hear your point of view. Um, help us to understand why you've drawn why you've drawn your conclusion and how it relates to the proposal. Public testimony for this hearing will be called in three groups, testimony in favor of the proposal, testimony opposed to the proposal, and neutral testimony. <laughs> Members wishing to speak tonight were asked to email comments to the city recorder prior to noon today with your name, topic of discussion, and city of residence. When you testify, please state your name and address for the record as this hearing will be taped. If you are participating online, click the raise your hand button at the appropriate time and wait to be recognized. If you are participating via telephone, dial star nine to raise your hand at the appropriate time and wait to be recognized. Okay, um, at this time, I would like to ask members of the Planning Commission if there are, if there are any that are abstaining uh, from this matter or need to declare any conflicts of interest. Please indicate the nature of the conflict of interest and indicate whether you intend to participate or abstain from the hearing. Jennifer? I will participate. Mr. Mercero? No conflict. Commissioner Milch? No conflicts, I'll participate. Andrew? I will participate, no conflict. Andrew? Uh, no conflict here, thank you. Wonderful, thank and you. I'll, partic I'll participate. Thank you. Okay, um, I would like city, I would like the staff to go ahead and present the report. Hold tight for just a moment.
Commissioner Langston, are you able to see the presentation? Yes, I am. Thank you. Yes, I can. Are you able to hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Thank you. Fantastic. Well, tonight we will be going through a very quick staff report. If you have any questions on the specific findings in the staff report, Report that was included in your packet, please let me know. I'm happy to go into more detail. Um, tonight, we will be talking about the draft housing code and amendments, and we will be looking at the municipal code and why we are here tonight, the statewide planning goals and the Metro's functional plan, and looking at the next steps as well as the specifics for what the draft amendments are. In the spring of 2021, the city of Gladstone initi initiated the zoning code rewrite project. And this uses details that were identified in the housing code audit that the city had previously done, as well as the Oregon revised statutes and the laws that the city has to comply with. The intent is to align the local policies and standards um, to the recently adopted House, House Bill 2001 and to clarify a few other housing related items in the current code. The work is made possible with the assistance of MIG, consultant John Southgate, DLCD and uh, members of the public who have participated as well as city staff. There we go. Tonight is a legislative hearing because it impacts all of the residential zoning districts in Gladstone. And so on the screen before you, you have the zoning map for Gladstone. House Bill 2001 is required in the low density residential zoning districts. And Gladstone has to allow at least a duplex as well as the middle housing types in areas that are zoned for low density residential zoning districts. And so up on the screen there, the R5 is the golden color and the R7.2 low density residential zoning district are, is that Northern area. Section 17.68 of the Gladstone Municipal Code authorizes a number of people or entities to um, initiate amendments to the code. And what we are considering tonight are potential amendments to the Gladstone Municipal Code and the Comprehensive Plan. And the City Council, the Planning Commission, the City Administrator, or a property owner can initiate this. And so we are here tonight to consider these amendments um, for the city. As the planning commission, you are considering the housing code amendments and you will be making a recommendation to the city council. And they are the final body that will um, hold another public hearing and make a decision. Your recommendation is essential in ensuring that the public has ample involvement as well as your expertise as the Planning Commission reviewing these amendments. Anytime we do any legislative amendments, we have to look at the statewide planning goals and guidelines. The first statewide planning goal is citizen involvement. And there was a survey that, that city residents and the public was able to participate in. There were work sessions, there were um, public hearing and noticing requirements. And so there was the ability for citizens to be involved in this important process. 
the, oh, I was gonna go through each one, Tammy, because they're so important. These are the statewide planning goals. This is what enables us to do planning in Oregon um, in a way that uh, aligns local jurisdictions with the state. So I apologize, but I will be going through them. Um, goal two is the land use planning process. And we are following that with our hearing tonight. Goal three to seven are the uh, agricultural and forest lands, open spaces, scenic and historic areas, natural resources, air, water, land use resources, and areas subject to natural disasters. These are all important, but the co-amendments that you are looking at tonight do not propose any changes to the environmental overlay districts that the city has. And so there is these these goals do not come into play because they are not impacted. They are not modified. They are not changed. Um, the goal eight is recreational needs. Goal nine is economy of state. Again, those are not necessarily impacted by the housing code amendments. But goal ten you see there is housing, and the amendments do not propose to reduce density of land zone for residential purposes. And after the housing needs analysis that the city conducted, it's very important to realize that we need all the land we can get for housing at appropriate densities. And the purpose of these amendments are to come into line with state legislation um, related to middle housing. And the proposed amendments are, required in the low density residential zones. They are optional in the multifamily residential zones, the MR zones. Um, these amendments do not uh, modify the public facilities and services, and they are exempt from um, some of the transportation planning that you usually have to go through for a legislative process. That, uh, that exemption came from the Oregon revised statutes. Um, it does not change anything in the Gladstone Municipal Code regarding energy conservation, urbanization, Willamette River Greenway, and um, therefore those are not applicable and we are not located near the beach. So we don't have estuaries, coastal shorelands, beaches, dunes, and ocean resources in the city of Gladstone. And with that, I am done. We do have to consider consistency with Metro's functional plan. However, Metro also has to consider the Oregon revised statutes. And so their functional plan will have to come into compliance as well. And so being in compliance with the Oregon revised statutes means that we will um, meet the Metro's functional plan when it is amended to be compliant. And as mentioned, um, the consistency with the transportation planning rule um, is, is exempt for middle housing legislation. Our comprehensive plan for Gladstone um, is, has been around since April of 1979. My copy here is very um, yellow. And the changes that you will see tonight do not impact the goals that are found in the comprehensive plan, but some of the policies. And remember the comprehensive plan is the guiding overarching document that guides the zoning code. The zoning code is supposed to implement the comprehensive plan with specifics. And so to, bring middle housing into Gladstone, the comprehensive plan also needed to be modified. And so that will be looked at in more detail at the end. But as we consider these amendments, I thought it would be um, useful to look at the land use planning goals in the comprehensive plan. And the first one there is to provide and maintain a high standard for Gladstone's quality of life and to ensure a factual basis for land use decisions and actions to establish a planning process and policy framework for this purpose. Next one. 
there's too many words to say them all. Sorry. So I'll just look at the goals. Um, the housing goal is to meet the housing needs of all segments of the population through optimum utilization of housing resources for the construction, rehabilitation, and maintenance of the diversity of housing types at appropriate locations, price ranges, and rent levels, while preserving and enhancing the integrity and identity of existing residential neighborhoods. So middle housing, the ability to have duplexes, triplexes, quadplexes in existing residential neighborhoods to provide options for current property owners, future property owners, current residents, future residents to have a variety of housing available. That was the intent of House Bill 2001 and it seems to be in line with the comprehensive plan. And so uh, the staff recommendation is for the Gladstone Planning Commission to consider these amendments and discuss potential uh, changes that are needed or not needed to what you have in your packet, and then draft uh, a recommendation for city council to consider. And that concludes my presentation. Thank you very much. Um, at this time, I'm going to ask, have we received any correspondence on this matter other than those items included in the agenda materials? I have not received any. Okay. Um, I guess I can move on to public testimony. I apologize. This is John Southgate, and we, we could hand this out when we get to it. We did get communication only yesterday from DLCD staff who are part of the group that's been reviewing this code read right. So I could hand this out now or we wait until uh, the gentleman from uh, MIG alludes to it and kind of describes the details. It's up to you. Um, could we have it in our hands for when he, I'm assuming he is going to speak. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm going to move along to public testimony. Does anyone wish to speak in support of the proposal? I show nothing on Zoom. Does anyone wish to speak in opposition to the proposal? I see nothing here. Does anyone wish to provide any testimony that is neither in support of or in opposition to the proposal? Yeah, we have another presentation from MIG before okay. we go any further. Go any further. Okay. Thank you. Good evening. Hey, good evening, everyone. Can everybody hear me okay? Yes, I can hear you fine. Great. Great, thank you for having us. My name is John Finis, and I am a project manager and planner with MIG, and we're the consulting firm that's been helping the city of Gladstone with this uh, middle housing zoning code update. Uh, with me tonight, I've got Sue Gardner, a colleague of mine that's been helping on this process as well. Um, so what I'd like to do is briefly touch on uh, a little bit more on what uh, Joy Fields had, had discussed in the staff report in that presentation, talk a little bit more about our process, uh, but specifically talk about some of the feedback we've received from the online community survey that we've administered, and then talk about some of the amendments uh, to the proposed code changes that we've discussed at the previous meeting with the city council and planning commission at that joint meeting. So let me share my screen. Okay, is that pulling up okay for everyone? Great. Yes, it is. So Joy alluded to some of the reasons and goals behind this code update. And I just wanted to touch on those. Again, I think they're very important for all of us to consider. Uh, the first is we know that there's a housing crisis. We're feeling that all over in Gladstone as well. 
we know there's a need for more affordable housing options and more housing choice throughout the community. Uh, the city has done lots of studies. We've got a housing needs analysis, a code audit, uh, the work that we've built upon and all those studies that really shows a need for more housing uh, variety, more housing options. So we know we, we need to meet those needs by providing more opportunities. We need to meet the requirements for recent state legislation with House Bill 2001. We also want to involve the community, and I want to share with you what we've heard and what we've done to make sure that took place. And then finally, as part of the House Bill 2001 requirements is the need to have an adopted updated code by June 30th, 2022. So our process, I know we've uh, met before with Planning Commission. Um, we've been at this for a while now, since last summer. And the reason is really to build a process to understand conditions, to involve the community, and to do this very methodically, to make sure we've, we've got all the details that we need to. So each step, we've had uh, two different advisory committees. We've had a technical advisory committee. Um, we've had a needed housing advisory committee. And we've had various opportunities for community engagement in each step. Uh, the last time we had a chance to meet at the joint meeting with Planning Commission City Council, we talked in a lot more detail on uh, what we found with the code audit, with what we described with uh, potential code changes, we called those code concepts, and discussed some various uh, uh, opportunities for code amendments. So here we are with the review and adoption phase. This is obviously the public hearing to consider the proposed amendments. And then we'll have uh, the city council hearing to consider uh, any final uh, recommendations or changes. So we know that we have certain rules to abide by with the House Bill 2001 requirements, but we also know in Gladstone, it's very critical to hear from the community, uh, both to help the community understand what these proposed changes could be, and also to hear what some of the concerns and uh, questions might be that are out there. So to do that, we had a number of different ways. Uh, I mentioned the two different committees. The needed housing advisory committee was more of what you'd consider a, uh, a community committee. So members of the public, we had uh, some uh, different members of the industry, real estate developers and so on. We met at various times. And then a technical advisory committee. Uh, this is really to ensure various state, local, regional requirements were met as we developed the code amendments. Uh, we met with Planning Commission, Gladstone Planning Commission back in November, uh, November 16th last year. And since that time, we had a project webpage where we added project information, so memos, uh, findings from, from various aspects of the project. And the website is also where we held a online community survey, which we recently closed. On the web page, we also had an informational webinar. Again, a key goal of this project. There's a lot of information. A lot of it is very complicated. So we knew that we had to explain this in a way that's easy to understand. And that was really the goal of that online webinar. And as I mentioned, we last met not that long ago, back in March, uh, with members of the city council for that joint meeting to discuss proposed changes. At that meeting, we also talked about the need to extend that online survey. I think there were uh, a few folks that had requested that. And so that's what we did. We extended the online survey. And I wanted to uh, provide some highlights on uh, the survey results now that we closed the survey. So I just wanted to, to point out a couple of different results uh, from the public survey. Again, this was not a statistically significant survey. This was an open access online survey posted on the city's webpage. But uh, we find it very helpful to see uh, kind of what, what's, the, what's the feel out there in the community. So one question we asked was, uh, given various strategies to uh, support desirable housing opportunities, what, what do you think are the, the most beneficial strategies? What's, what's going to work the best? So you can see some of the top uh, responses here. And I think it's very telling that a lot of what the interests are align really well with what the proposed code changes are. And specifically, I mean that the, the top response here, 31% mentioned to uh, permit smaller and attached housing and develop resident, residential neighborhoods. But I think it's also important for planning commission and, and, and others to consider 
there are lots of other ways and strategies to encourage more housing. Uh, so that second top response, encouraging more intense residential development in undeveloped areas, financial incentives, all the way down to the bottom of the list by offering development bonuses or other incentives. So lots of different ways to encourage housing choice. But again, I think it's very telling that the top response um, is very in line with what the proposed code amendments are. We asked about preferences. We mentioned briefly what the proposed code amendments would do. And again, the, the first draft of those code amendments were posted on the website. So uh, survey respondents had a chance to, to review the code amendments, then take the survey. So we asked, given these conditions, does this feel like the right path? Is the city of Gladstone on the right path? And overall, the majority, 36%, felt that the direction's about right. Middle housing should look and feel a lot like a single family home and meet similar rules and standards. And that's exactly, uh, in a nutshell, what the proposed amendments are intending to do. There are a lot of uh, open-ended comments. So we, we provided an opportunity to do write-in comments. And in general, some of these really related to these three topics, providing flexibility, concern around parking, and by parking, we spent a fair bit of time, I know at our last joint meeting with our needed housing advisory committee, talking about the trade-offs with parking. Some of these requirements are from the uh, state rules. And in some ways, the opportunity is for the city to decide. In this case, there was a pretty clear, uh, pretty clear support to require uh, the, the, the parking to be off street, to not have the option to provide parking on street. So that's pretty clear uh, information that we got from the survey and from our committees. And finally, uh, overall input to ensure that whatever we're doing, whatever comes in, we're really being careful with existing homes. And I know that's what uh, Joy had called out with the comprehensive plan as a city goal. So making sure that we have a similar aesthetic to single family homes, uh, again, following along with what the intent of House Bill 2001 calls for. So really quickly, I wanted to highlight some of the proposed changes uh, from the last time we met at that joint work session. So as you recall, these are the, the Gladstone Municipal Code chapters that we're focusing on. These are the code chapters that have amendments that you're looking at tonight. So again, I just want to highlight some of these proposed changes, and then I want to make sure we uh, allow for time for discussion, of course. Uh, so in the definitions chapter, uh, there was a comment around uh, removing uh, large scale plan unit development, which we did. In chapter 1710 and chapter 1712, both of the focus uh, zoning districts for this project, for this effort, uh, there was a comment to add foster home back as a permitted use. <laughs> and then changing the minimum floor area of 400 square feet and a max of 800 square feet. Uh, for 1714 uh, multi-residential zoning district, we removed triplex, quadplex, townhomes, cottage cluster, basically the middle housing types from the MR zone. And there was discussion about what it, the, the intent of that zoning district is to really encourage higher density housing and by adding middle housing, we start to erode the intent of that zoning district. So we removed those out and we added those instead as a conditional use in that chapter. 1738 planned unit development, we removed on-street parking allowance and parking clarification for cottage clusters. In the off-street parking chapter 1748, we removed on-street parking allowance as credit, again, following on what we heard from the community and from uh, others throughout the process to really uh, support required parking being off street on the site. We removed middle housing type uh, minimum parking standards and allowed for a max for design review applications. No changes to 1762 or 1776 or 1780. So again, a few changes in there. I just want to make sure those, those were clear. So uh, yesterday we received some additional comments from uh, Department of Land Conservation and Development, DLCD. Uh, Minister Southgate mentioned they uh, members of DLCD were on our technical advisory committee. 
So they had an opportunity to review uh, draft materials, the amendments, uh, as we got closer to the draft that you're looking at tonight. So we did receive some comments uh, as, as recent as yesterday. And so I, I realize um, you all haven't had a chance to review these until right now. So what I wanted to do is just walk through uh, in general what we heard from DLCD and talk about next steps. So these are kind of out of order in the uh, email that you're reviewing. I'm starting with the proposed changes that are more of the um, uh, low hanging fruit, I guess we could say. Uh, I should mention we did have a good discussion earlier today with uh, uh, DLCD and the city to talk through some of these changes and clarify exactly uh, what's, what's requested in here. So uh, starting off with the low hanging fruit uh, changes, 1706 definitions, uh, there is a clarification here from DLCD to make sure that our definition for cottage cluster more closely aligns with the definition in HB 2001 in the Oregon Administrative Rules. And that really has to do with uh, how and where we decide to discuss minimum units per acre, uh, moving that out of the definition into the specific standards in the zoning districts themselves to talk about uh, units in, in a development. So those were removed, the definition was clarified, and we uh, are uh, suggesting that we remove and update the uh, siting standards in 1710 and 1712. Uh, let's see, 1710 and 1712, um, the comment was the uh, we can't prohibit more than four dwelling units per acre. So we would clarify we would want to exempt cottage clusters and townhomes. And again, that's to ensure that we're meeting consistency with the state rules. There was a concern in both of those zoning districts around the amendment that uh, was added to require pedestrian access, a minimum of four feet. Uh, and this was in response to um, members of our advisory committee really supporting uh, greater accessibility, ADA accessibility with development and design of middle housing, new housing. So that's something that was added. Uh, the concern from DLCD was the same requirement isn't also required for single family detached housing. And if you remember the rules, uh, administrative rules for HB 2001, whatever we require for middle housing, we also have to require for, for single family housing. Uh, exceptions, there was a, a very small uh, change here, and that is to also add duplex in 1776-030, where it talks about uh, lot size requirements, so it's single family uh, dwellings and duplexes. So we would add that into 1776. So um, some other comments, and uh, what we wanted to talk about tonight is um, some options with these comments. As we mentioned, these are things that we received uh, yesterday. And so you haven't had a chance to review these. Uh, we only recently received these, so we're still talking through these. But I did want to mention a little bit more about what these requests are, where these comments come from. So the first one you'll see in that email is another recent piece of legislation. There's been a lot in 2022, as I'm sure you're aware, uh, House Bill 4064. And that prohibits cities from regulating manufactured dwellings in a manner that is inconsistent with detached single family dwellings. And if that sounds familiar to HB 2001, it's essentially uh, doing a similar, um, a similar thing to uh, uh, manufactured dwellings. So that's just a general note. I did wanna point out in Gladstone's two single family uh, zoning districts, uh, 1710 and 1712, Manufactured dwellings are permitted outright. So that's a, that's a good thing. So the other comments, these are the first two, I believe in the order that were received in the email. These are the first two. And this has to do with another separate set of state rules. And this is specifically ORS uh, 197-307 that prohibits cities from allowing residential uses through discretionary reviews. So in this case, the existing code that Gladstone has, there are basically three locations where there might be a conflict. 
And that's again in 1710 and 1712, really the, the two uh, zoning districts that we're really focusing on here with the code updates. Currently, and even before we started this process for middle housing, the city's code uh, allowed multi-household dwellings as a conditional use. So again, under uh, ORS 197, that would be considered a discretionary review, so that would not uh, be compliant with those, those rules. Conversely, in 1714, the MR zone, the current code, again, the code that the cities had even before this process, allows detached single family as a conditional use. So again, in conflict with that discretionary review process. Um, it also impacts what we had changed in the proposed amendments. I mentioned on the previous slide, we moved the um, middle housing types in 1714 instead of a permitted use. We moved those to a conditional use. Those would also uh, not be in compliant based on those rules. So as I mentioned, we had a, a good discussion today with uh, representatives from DLCD in the city to talk through some of the options. These, we really feel as though those are the probably the most impactful comments that we received. So we wanted to, to pre present to the Planning Commission tonight is essentially what we find is some, some options for how to address the, uh, the discretionary um, review for housing types that currently exist in the code. So three, we, we really feel there, there are three ways, I guess we've got three bullet points here, uh, a few different options that we wanna consider. Uh, the first is this is really, we feel a conditional use issue. There's a, a portion of the city's code where uh, recent state rules have now made it so that the city's code is, is not compliant with the conditional use section. And that includes what's in 1710, uh, 1712 in the MR zone. So one option would be we would discuss the middle housing amendments that you've reviewed and worked on in, in your packet tonight and talk about uh, updating the conditional use standards at a separate time. That could be one option. Uh, the second option is a um, little bit more, more involved, at least for the immediate term, and that would be to go one way or another. We either permit in 1710 and 1712, we either permit multi-household dwellings outright, so they're not a conditional use, or we disallow them entirely. We disallow multi-household dwellings in both of those zoning districts. Likewise, in 1714 for the uh, MR zone, the city could decide to either permit or disallow single family dwellings in that zone as well. Again, the, the question here, the concern is that these are currently a conditional use and that's considered a discretionary review. So of course, these uh, second option, if the city decides to permit or disallow these housing types, uh, if we uh, permit single family dwellings in 1714, that triggers House Bill 2001, we would also have to uh, permit outright the middle housing types into that zoning district as well. So uh, a lot of trade-offs. Uh, we realized this was uh, late in the process. Uh, we all didn't have a, a really good chance to discuss these, but we did wanna uh, present these to you tonight and talk over a few different options. So that's, that's what we wanted to present. Um, however, we still have the amendments in your packet tonight and we know you wanna discuss those as well. So um, with that, I'll turn it back over to uh, planning commissioners and uh, in my presentation. Um, this is John Southgate again. I just wanted to clarify your options. If you're inclined, if, if you know, to take action on everything before you tonight, great. This is a lot of material. I imagine you'll have questions for um, our uh, MIG folks as well as possibly staff. And especially as John said, um, 
we got these comments from DLCD yesterday. <laughs> so we certainly have, a, John did a great job of laying out, here's different options. As, as he noted, we, we discussed these, but one option you have, if, if you feel you could support, I'll just make up a number, 80% of the, of the package that, that came before, has come before you, but hold off the last 20%, as well as some or all of the new DLCD material, you do have the option of, of I guess I'll say continuing the hearing to your May meeting. I gather you have at least one other hearing, but um, I, I, I want to stress, you don't have to feel like, okay, you got to cover all this and we're going to be here till 1, 1 a.m. Not that I'm not prepared to do that, but um, um, you have that option. Because then if, if you were to do that and say, all right, we need another hearing, um, I would hope you could accomplish it at least in the second hearing. Then we go to, instead of a May city council hearing, a June city council hearing. So that's, I just don't, I, we don't want you to feel pressure like we got to do it all tonight. You, you don't have to, so. I would like to hear from um, my fellow planning commissioners. What what do you guys think? I start with uh, Commissioner Mercero. Uh, I've read at least two packages now, which covered nearly 200 pages that made hundreds of changes But the packages to me really outlined a couple of things in the getting the standards down to its consistent manner and changing some wordage such as uh, homes or family or whatever it was and crossing those, those names out. And if we try to detail the hundreds of issues on there, uh, we'd be here for a week. And my recommendation at this point, unless you saw some glaring errors, which I didn't see any, but that doesn't mean I look close enough. Uh, I would recommend catching those clearing errors if they're there, but accepting the package the way it is and maybe have a timetable of say a year or six months or whatever to review the comments that people will undoubtedly come up with. When I say people, the, the Gladstone residents who have multi-millions dollars worth of property come up with some point that, that becomes a problem. And then listening to those problems and then taking them on at some time period, so. I said a lot, I'm not sure if I was very clear, but uh, I believe there's too much to try to go over that for a third or fourth time to catch the grammar errors or whatever in the speech. Commissioner Milch. Well, I'd like some clarification uh, from MIG. Um, we need to be in compliance with House Bill 2001 by the end of June. Uh, so uh, we can't put the, this off beyond that. Uh, how much of the comments that came from DLCD uh, are uh, related to matters which would put us out of compliance with uh, House Bill 2001, the way the uh, recommendations are written now? Uh, you referred to the conditional use issues as something we could postpone and deal with a little bit later. But when you say later, do you mean after June, maybe in conjunction with what we're going to be doing on uh, downtown revitalization? Or is this something that has to be resolved before we can adopt this legislation 
uh, to meet the House Bill 2001 deadline? Yeah, great, great question. Um, I'll start with the, oh, I don't have a short answer, but I'll, I'll start with the, the low hanging fruit items I had in my presentation. So in your email, the copy of the email you received from DLCD, the discussion we had uh, this afternoon earlier uh, before this meeting, we're confident that um, basically numbers four and five, so five has a bunch of subparts. We're confident that we can make those changes and be in compliance with uh, Division 46 with House Bill 2001. Um, House Bill 4064, so that's the manufactured homes, uh, rules, the provisions for manufactured homes. Um, this, is, this is an interesting requirement where essentially uh, local jurisdictions really don't have to update their municipal code to be in compliance. What this does is if there is a conflict, let's say there's an applicant um, looking at building a manufactured home, um, that applicant would have the ability to follow the state rules if there's a conflict with the city's rules for manufactured homes. And there wouldn't be an issue in terms of, of the process. So House Bill 4064 applies regardless of whether the city of Gladstone upstate updates their code to um, reflect that or not. Um, that leaves us with points number one and two. Uh, the discretionary uses, the, the conditional uses that we talked about. Um, I would say that based on our discussion with DLCD, everything else in the packet that you have tonight, the proposed amendments, would bring the city into compliance with the rules, uh, Division 46, with the rules for House Bill 2001. Um, what the implications are for those conditional uses in the zoning districts could be that if an applicant came into the city, uh, let's say for the um, MR zone, let's say an applicant came in and said, I'd like to uh, hypothetically build a single family home in the MR zone, that could then trigger uh, a process where the city might be uh, in conflict with with House Bill 2001, because we, we, we can't allow conditional uses um, in those zoning districts. But by and large, I, I guess I'm rambling a little bit. I think the short answer is we're confident, and especially with our discussion today with DLCD, the changes that we presented tonight that we talked about since the joint meeting we had, the few clarifications here, I guess it's numbers four and five in the email, with those changes, we should be compliant. The city should be compliant with House Bill 2001. Um, I have another question. Um, with regard to some of the matters you brought up earlier, uh, specifically the allowing um, single family uh, or single household residences in multifamily zones um, or allowing uh, middle housing in those same zones. As I recall from the discussion you had prior to the City Council Planning Commission joint meeting, part of the reason for that is because we didn't want to reduce density by replacing apartments with, um, uh, even though they're higher density than single family, uh, other types of housing that would be lower density than, than what the apartments currently are. Um, and because that would, that would be counterproductive in terms of our housing needs analysis and the need to add uh, housing units to the community. Uh, so how do we reconcile that issue? Um, do we uh, do we have to eliminate the possibility of both and make multifamily uh, zones strictly multifamily or a multi-household? Uh, what would be the way to uh, proceed with that that would that would meet the housing need goal as well as comply with uh, the codes and state requirements? Yeah, another good question. I think the that's what we wanted to, to cover tonight is to begin that discussion. I think there are important implications no matter which way we decide tonight, the Planning Commission decides. Um, and we did definitely talk about the need to retain 
you know, the, the city's um, highest density zone, it's intended for higher density housing. So if we start to erode that, it's counter to what it sounds like the intent of that, that zoning district is. Um, conversely, if we, if we prohibit, or if we allow those types of uh, uses, if we allow single family outright, uh, as I mentioned, that would require the city to then allow all the different middle housing types. Um, so it it does have it does have some uh, some trade offs with that. However, as I mentioned um, before, we had this before we had this email. Um, really, it, it it appears to us that most of the changes that we need to be in compliance. Uh, have to do with those modifications that we discussed. I think it's the, the last couple of bullets in that email. Uh, so don't know if that answers your question enough, but this this is a this is an important discussion. Um, you know, the fact that the city's code is out of compliance, not necessarily with House Bill 2001, uh, but with other state rules that we just found out about. Yeah, there's that one. Uh, one more question from Commissioner Milch. Um, you indicated that the uh, the Housing Needs uh, uh, Advisory Committee and the Technical Advisory Committee had concern regarding um, access ADA compliance with housing, but that you couldn't require it of middle housing if you didn't also require it of uh, single household uh, homes. Um, what might be some options for a way to achieve that, what I think is a very important uh, equity related goal of those committees without putting it in the zoning? Can I add to that too? Uh, Cause I was kind of wondering, sorry. Uh, so, you know, it, it, I, I understand their point of view that, you know, uh, we can't make them do something that's different from a single home, but our, our code is saying that a single household, that door is gonna be facing the street. Whereas it's different from those uh, duplex triplexes where you could have doors on any side of the property. So that that's where I just don't understand how uh, that, that point kind of um, sticks. Yeah. Um... So the, to clarify, I think the, the comment uh, that DLCD provided, I think it is, it's simply a matter of if we require something for middle housing, we also have to require it for single family attached housing. I, I, I know you, you get that, uh, that part of it. Um, that would be one option. So we just, if we're allowing it, if we're requiring it uh, for middle housing, then we want to require it also for, for single family detached housing. A second option we, we talked about today, uh, there's a provision in um, Division 46 that's called Alternative Siting or Design Standards. And DLCD mentioned there are examples of this where a local jurisdiction um, might come up with a different policy that's not in the administrative rules, uh, but that have a, a benefit to the community, uh, that have uh, something that uh, you know, aligns with the values of the city. And in this case, it's, it's about accessibility. And we, we heard that pretty clearly. So the, the OARs as a separate option, there is a process that the city can take basically to provide findings to say why uh, a requirement like this is necessary for middle housing types that might not otherwise be required for single family housing. So that is an option uh that's here in the oars that that the city can take commissioner labonte do you have any questions um well uh just the uh just for clarification is the question now should we um continue till may or are we addressing um individual items now Well, oh, great. And I, I do you want to do it all or do you want to take this specific these items here and pull it over to our next meeting and have another public hearing? I'm understanding that correctly, right? Okay. And I, I would be um, I my first I believe that uh, to continue till May would be a wise decision. 
Commissioner Jennifer, because I know I'm going to say your name wrong. I'm sorry. <laughs> we'll get it eventually. Okay. Um, I am going to agree with uh, Commissioner Levante. I think that for the majority, I'm, I'm good to go on, but um, I would personally like some more uh, time until May to review the zoning and the conditional um, purposes as well. And if I could add, I think the public needs an opportunity to review DLCD's comments as well. Agreed. I, I do believe that, um, I guess the consensus is, is that uh, we're going to need to hold this over until our next meeting. And I'm assuming that'll be another public hearing, correct? Okay. Um, because yes, just like Jennifer and the rest, I'm, I'm good to go with what we have in our packet, but I need more with this, with the additional information. Okay. Should I continue on with public testimony and move forward so we can and do they need to continue with the public hearing to the, they won't close the public hearing at this point? Right, so you can go ahead, Chair Smith, and see if there's any additional public discussion. And then a motion could be made to continue the hearing to May okay. 17th. Okay, May 17th. Okay, let me finish with the public testimony and we'll get onto that point here. Um, is there any further testimony or any further questions from the audience? I have not received any via Zoom. I do not show any hands up. Does staff have anything to add which specifically addresses a question or issue raised during this testimony? I believe I do. Please proceed. Um, there was a commissioner who asked if there were any glaring issues with these amendments. There are no glaring issues from my perspective, but there is an omission that I would love for you guys to consider and discuss. And that is the issue of sidewalks. So sidewalks are required for design review um, applications and they're required for land division applications. They are not required for a single family home currently, and they're not required if someone resurrects historically platted lot lines to provide a building location for a new home. So if you think of the R5 zoning district in Gladstone that was platted in the 1920s, um, a lot of the homes in that district are on two lots and they can resurrect the historic lot line and have two legally established lots because they were platted. And um, by doing that, they don't have to go through a land division review. Therefore, sidewalks don't have to be built for single family homes, duplexes, and with middle housing now in that zoning district, sidewalks wouldn't have to be built for a quadplex or um, cottage clusters. Well, there, there's some provisions in the code that MIG proposed for cottage clusters to, to ensure access to the cottage clusters. But along the street, um, sidewalks are something that I have heard from the city council as important and from you all as important. And so if we require sidewalks for middle housing, we also have to require it for single family homes. Because again, the middle housing bill has to be the same or less, restri re less restrictive for middle housing than for single family. So I would love for you all to consider sidewalks. And there is, uh, section chapter 1750. I'm happy to share my screen if given the opportunity. Oh, I'm not on Zoom. Never mind. Sorry, I'm so used to being from home. If you email it to me, I can bring it up on the screen. Okay. Um, it's a link to the code, and I can read it verbatim. It's 17.50.020, uh, and there's a provision for curbs and sidewalks, and it's to provide curbs, comma, 
associated drainage, comma, and sidewalks within the right of way or easement for public roads and streets. And this, again, this section applies to um, land divisions and design review. Would we like to provide that in our single family residential zoning districts? Yes or no answers, uh, Commissioner Mercero. I've been on the Planning Commission, or started in the Planning Commission in 2007. I remember maybe the first meeting that talked about sidewalks and, and the city, we'll, we'll group it in the city, has been talking about sidewalks since that time. And a lot of it groups around a lot of property that are around that if they did build a house now would most likely have to put sidewalks in. And that's the biggest issue, I believe. Be great to go by that, but I think there's gonna be a heck of a lot of concerns if that's put in. So am I safe to assume that your response is a no then? I've just given input at this point. Okay. Um, you might convince me otherwise. Commissioner Milch, yes or no? Uh, I'm inclined to say yes, but uh, the hearing that we had uh, a couple of months ago regarding the church on Glen Echo, uh, it was clear that we have areas where there are large, uh, you know, swaths of, of street that have no sidewalks and installation of sidewalks on a piecemeal basis, one by one, because of a housing project on a particular lot or a divided lot, um, it kind of falls into the same category as that was. So uh, I think the discussion at that time uh, and when that was reviewed later by the council was that the city kind of has to have a plan for how sidewalks are gonna go in citywide and that whatever we do uh, you know, needs to conform with that. Not that we make the requirement of the homeowner to install the sidewalk, uh, but that maybe it be a requirement that it, uh, it fit with a larger overall plan done by the city. Um, so, uh, I, I agree with, with uh, Planner Field's assessment of the importance of it, um, but I know that um, uh, you know, getting from point A to point B is going to be a very uh, difficult uh, path. Commissioner Levante, yes or no? I'm not sure you've gotten a yes or no yet. I know. Um, the, the issue of sidewalks, um, they're expensive. It um, can be an issue for folks you want to build, but there's a safety element there. Um, you know, I'd, I'd like more guidance, I think, um, regarding kind of the various perspectives on that, you know, being someone who is very concerned with traffic safety. You know, the knee jerk reaction is yes, um, the sidewalks. Um, However, I think there's probably um, a deeper discussion that, I, that I'd like to have in that. So I'm not sure I can truly make a yes or no right now. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Langston. Uh, I think I agree with uh, Commissioner Milch. Like I, I wanna say yes, but uh, without any kind of uh, formal plan to, to kind of guide us with, through that process, uh, um, seems that could be difficult to to force people. Uh, I guess um, one question I would have, would we still have the ability to um, request that they put the sidewalk in through a special conditions request? That's a good question. For all single family resident, residential building permits and for all middle housing um, development, they will just have to have a building permit. They don't have any conditions of approval. They don't okay. have to meet anything. And so it has to be in the code in a clear and objective manner that could be um, tied to a building permit if we want middle housing or single family homes to have sidewalks. 
when they are constructed as a new structure. Is that all your questions? Okay. Hold on a second, I want to go to Jennifer. I'm going to say yes. I think this could be a really good opportunity to start writing writing the requirement for parking into code. Um, though I would be interested in the time it would take to do that, if we'd be able to accomplish that by the time we have to get HB 2001 integrated by June. I don't know if that's too much of an undertaking, um, but I'm I'm leaning towards yes. Um, I'm leaning towards yes as well for several reasons. Um, I want some clarification though. We're talking about any new development or redevelopment, correct? So um, it doesn't mean that all the sidewalks in the city of Gladstone need to be replaced or whatever, that's what I thought. Um, I guess before our next meeting, would it be possible to have something from you um, to see roughly what we could be looking at in the way of adding it? Um, because I do think that would be important moving forward because I believe in consistency and being equitable and fair. It shouldn't just be for some and not for others. But again, to Commissioner Milch's uh, comment about the, the church situation, it's, it's hard because we have some areas that are seem more rural than right down in the lowlands and the and certain areas we're not consistent and i'd like to see us get there okay um if nobody else has anything on this topic go ahead and i guess the question would be with the department of transportation did, um, there must be guidance via the state for sidewalks um city of gladstone has de design standards the city of Gladstone has a transportation plan that identifies key streets that are um, priorities for pedestrian improvements, such as sidewalks. But for being fair and having the same requirements over the entire city, it would be a question of, um, is it fair to only require it along those priority streets? Or is it all streets? And we don't have the final say anyway. This would have to go before the city council and they would make the final determination. Um, but again, if we could see something at the next meeting, then we can see if there's some way that we could have it included. Um, should we move on to the rest of this so that we'll be able to close the public hearing? Okay. Go ahead. Uh, if I and I'd, I'd be interested to know how other cities approach the same issue too. Okay. I am intimately familiar with Clackamas County, okay. <laughs> and that involves between Gladstone and Milwaukee. So in Clackamas County, there is a fee in lieu of option for property owners who are not within 200 feet of a constructed sidewalk, or if there is to topographical concerns or other concerns that would prohibit them. And they can pay a fee in lieu of up to three dwelling units. So a triplex, a duplex, and a single family home could potentially pay a fee in lieu of building the sidewalk. It, the fee in lieu of cost is supposed to cover the cost of building that same amount of sidewalk in high use areas such as those pedestrian corridors that are identified in the transportation system plan or around the schools or- Downtown revitalization. Exactly. Okay. Um, the, that is the intent with the philo in Clackamas County. Um, four or more dwelling units um, have to build the sidewalks. And that has been the code um, before middle housing. And so there is no uh, proposed change to that. So just to clarify what you're saying, if you pay a fee in lieu of, it doesn't mean that the city will build the sidewalk in front of your property. The city might use that money to build the sidewalk in an identified priority corridor. So you will contribute to the overall walkability and pedestrian friendliness of the city at large without necessarily having one in front of your own. That, uh, that's kind of consistent with what I was asking about before about having the city having a plan and, and residents being able to uh, participate in that plan. Uh, so that's, that's something that's, that's an approach we might consider. 
If uh, no one has any further questions regarding the testimony or any other additional comments, I would like someone to make a motion to close the public hearing. Well, let me let me ask for clarification first. Uh, I think we're looking to uh, to carry it continue. over. Yes. To yes. Uh, what's the term? Uh, continue. Continue the public hearing. Uh, your 17th. schedule tonight was to have public testimony and then questions and comments from the planning commission. If we continue the public testimony, will will the plan, planning commission still continue to participate in discussion of what's been brought before us this, tonight? Uh, that isn't problematic related to DLCD? It's at the pleasure of the, of the commission. What would you like to do? I'd like to be able to discuss a few of the things in the, in the language that came before us because there might be other things we want to have them uh, work on if we're gonna look at a revised, revised version in May, uh, there might be some things that I'd like to see them uh, change in this. Okay, um, I do believe, according to my script here, we can still close the, the hearing and deliberate and or discuss. Continue the hearing. In other words, we're not we're not closing it finally. No, we are continue. we are saying that we intend to continue it to next month. I, I move we continue the public hearing uh, and public testimony until our uh, May meeting, May seventeenth. Yeah. Is anyone to second, please? A second. Okay. Do we do a roll call vote? Yes. Okay. Tammy, please. Commissioner Langston? Yes. Commissioner Milch? Yes. Commissioner Labonte? Yes. Commissioner Mercero? Yes. Commissioner Bulbada? Yes. Chair Smith? Yes. Chair Smith? Okay. So now we can continue to, with our discussion. Okay. If anyone has anything more they want to open up and talk about here in regards to that, because we've got a continuance to carry over to the May 17th meeting. Anybody have, okay. Chair Smith. Um, I had a question for uh, the folks who developed the code from MIG. Um, you indicated that you removed the definition of large scale planned unit development. I see that uh, with the blue cross out in section 17.06.451, that's on page 3-40. But I noticed there were a couple of other references to exceptions for large scale planned unit development in other sections of the code. Um, in the difference between uh, an 80,000 square foot planned unit development, which is our normal definition, and a large scale, which was two acres, it's not a very big difference. So I can understand eliminating the large scale. Um, but does that, do we need to fine tune some of that language and remove references to large scale planned unit development when we no longer have it defined in the code? I can try to find one of those places if, if you want me to. Um, if you look on page 3-52, um, which is in the 7.2. Uh, sure, I can answer this question. Okay, all right. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so in the existing adopted code right now, there is no definition for large planned uh, unit development. But the reference is embedded into the um, residential district zones. Um, and so when we were developing this, we thought it would be a good idea to define what a large scale planned uh, unit development is. Um, but the feedback that we heard was that um, the city of Gladstone really doesn't have um, land of that size. So it seemed to uh, it seemed unnecessary. Um, the references within the zoning districts, the residential zoning districts, have been there. So we didn't we didn't add anything. We didn't change it. Um, if you wanted to, you could add that back in and change the um, numerical you know standard. 
but really the two acres was, you know, in, in thinking about land use, you know, what we would be considering, or we would consider a large scale planning and development, but it was almost, um, I don't want to say arbitrary number, but maybe that's, maybe that is the right word to use in that case. Well, thank you. That's helpful. And, and I think I made the comment at the, at the, uh, the joint meeting that we had last month, that even though we don't have large uh, plots of land in our residential areas, our code permits uh, planned unit developments in any zone, including commercial zones. And it's some of our commercial zones uh, along 82nd Avenue or uh, McLaughlin Boulevard, where we have large parcels of land which would meet that 80,000 square foot requirement, that's just under two acres, that could eventually become planned unit developments. So I think it's important that we have some language related to that in our code, uh, uh, because uh, as commissioners here have asked on a couple of occasions, uh, there may be a time in the future when uh, property owners along McLaughlin Boulevard decide that car dealerships are no longer the way to use their uh, expensive land that providing housing uh, adjacent to transportation corridors might be something that we would see, you know, 10, 15, 20 years down the, down the road. So uh, that's why I think it's important to have clear language on. That. And we can address that with the next round uh, with any additional changes as well. Thank you. Anybody else have anything they'd like to ask or give input? I guess I've got a question and maybe just clarification or um, regarding, I guess, the parking credit for off street parking. Um, am I reading here in 17.48030? Um, <clears throat> yes, it's going to be 3 86 for the page. Um, uh, the the off-site parking from within 500 feet uh, walking distance is this am i missing something here or would this be a tool that builders could use um in middle housing or anything let's say um th that would be h off street parking okay, if i can just get some clarification or a little education on that please I'm sorry, Commissioner, can you repeat the um, code section? Sure. So that's going to be, um, that's going to be, am I looking correctly? It's going to be 17.48. Uh, it's on page 3-90. Mine, it says 3-86, and that's H, off street, um, off site parking. Uh, I, I believe. This is this is John with MIG Commissioner. I believe um, maybe one thing. I guess this is one way to answer your your question is that specific section. So the off street uh, off site parking provision that's only related to an application or a use that would require design review. In other words, go ahead. Yeah, in other words, the um, middle family housing that we're, we're discussing tonight uh, would not have that same design review requirement. Great, thank you. Um, and when, when, when we're talking about historic, oh, sorry, when we're talking about historic buildings, is this, is this something that's in the, the register for historic buildings? Um, or just uh, when we approach it, I know it's kind of, you know, not considered to be an issue necessarily, but I'm kind of curious as to what specifically like counts as a historic building. Is it an age or is it something that's on a register um, for historic importance? That is a very good question. <laughs> um, and I believe that that answer is embedded in the goal five on how they define historic um, structures. Um, give me a second, I'm able to look that up. 
Commissioner, is that is that in relation to a specific uh, section of the code, or is that just in general? Um, I'm just wondering if that's you mentioned. Know, I'm not looking at a specific section of the code. Uh, it would be in the notes that we received. What was it? Yeah, it came up when we were going through the review here. Let me see. Uh, and Joe, I know that you had mentioned regarding the historic and uh, Joy, isn't there a definition? The goals. For a historic building? There is a definition for a historic building, but the, the distinction that Commissioner Labonte is requesting is an important one because there are a lot of homes in Gladstone that are 50 years or older but there are less homes that are designated as historic landmarks. And there, there was a study done of Gladstone that identified the contributing structures that contribute to the historic um, era of Gladstone, but those aren't necessarily designated as historic. Um, so I, I am also pulling up the Oregon Revised Statutes and the definitions to see if the definitions in Goal 5 have a reference. And I, I'm sure that one of the MIG staff may also be doing that. So bear with us one moment. Oh, thank you. Commissioner Langston, are you going to have any further questions? Uh, nope. Um, okay. I'm pretty, yeah, I'm pretty. I just wanted pretty, to check pretty, in with you. I didn't forget about you. Yep, no worries. Chair Smith? Yes. If I might have another bite at the apple, I have another question. <laughs> Let them finish with uh, looking up what they're looking up right now, and then you're okay. more than welcome. I did not see it in uh, sixty uh, in the definitions pertaining to the statewide planning goal, um, and so I'm not sure if Sue had any more luck than I did. Yes, the only thing I'm seeing is um, a definition for historic resources, which are defined as building structures, objects, sites, or districts that potentially have a significant relationship to events or conditions of the human past. I don't see one specifically for a historic structure. Is that something that we can look into further and bring back before the commission at our next meeting in May? What specifically um, is your question regarding that? Sure, well, the, um, let me train my thought here. Oh, as we're looking at some of these changes and, and you know, some of these buildings, um, I'm just uh, I'm wondering what can be, or how that process is for a new, let's say a duplex wants to go up on a property where, where there's a historic building or something like that, kind of how does that look um, for us? Like, is there, are there, how does that happen? <laughs> and, and what, basically what's the threshold for the city to, to say, hey, this is an, an, uh, this might be an issue or that's a, where the question for me really came up. Is there a clear registry for buildings that are, I don't wanna say off limits, but on, you know, that would take special consideration? There are registries for historic resources and specifically buildings. Um, however, I'm going to use my North Carolina experience where I was working for a historic review board and working with the State Historic Preservation Office there. Um, even if there is a, in North Carolina, even if a structure is a historic landmark, that 
there is only 365 days of holding before it can be removed. And that 365 days allows other entities to purchase the historic resource and move it, but it doesn't protect it okay. necessarily. And so um, there is no stay to demolition of a historic resource in North Carolina. Okay. I'm pretty sure it's the same here, but I'm not positive. Uh, this is John again, commissioners. I did want to point out in Division 46, the rules for um, uh, House Bill 2001, there is uh, there are some standards for how Goal 5 resources, historic resources, um, how a city can regulate um, middle housing, if you know if that's what we're focusing on tonight, how a city might go about doing that uh, citywide for middle housing. So essentially, um, there's there are, there's some description here that is pretty specific, uh, but it basically, if the city does not have uh, land use regulations that are adopted that protect uh, significant historic resources, and those are those are usually uh, part of the National Register of Historic Places, so those have to be documented registered historic places. If those resources aren't described uh, as such, there are additional measures that are outlined in uh, the OARs for middle housing, and then some limitations as well. So there's some guidance in the state rules. Thank you. Commissioner Milch, you had one more question. Yeah, I want to go back to the topic of accessory dwelling units. Um, I see uh, after our last meeting, you added a minimum size which uh, happens to be equivalent to what our former maximum size was. Uh, I don't know that will, what that will do for anybody who conducted an, uh, or constructed an ADU that was less than 400 square feet. Uh, but uh, after that meeting, uh, I also uh, forwarded to city staff some language uh, regarding uh, an exception to the maximum square footage. Um, and let me just preface this by saying, uh, in Gladstone, because of the topography of the land uh, and, and some of the types of buildings we have, we have a number of buildings that are what you would call split level homes or homes with uh, daylight basements or walkout basements that are would be very well suited to becoming uh, where the basement area or the lower floor would be very well suited to becoming an accessory dwelling unit attached to the home. Um, but some of those basements uh, in certain size homes may exceed that 800 square foot maximum. And back in November of 2020, this commission discussed the possibility of uh, having our language conform to that of uh, Oregon City Code, which had an additional sentence which said, conversion of an existing basement to an ADU shall be exempt from the size limits provided that no new floor area will be added with the conversion. And I once again want to make the case for adding a sentence like this to that section in both the 7.2 and 5.0 uh, single household uh, sections. Um, I don't want somebody who has a 900 square foot basement to feel like they need to somehow wall off 100 square feet of their basement in order to put in an ADU. Um, yeah, it, it makes more sense to allow those homes that, that are blessed with a little more square footage down there to be able to do, use the whole thing as an accessory dwelling unit. Um, I think that ADUs and, and probably duplexes too are going to be the, the low hanging fruit for uh, adding um, additional housing in this community. And we wanna make that process, you know, that's what we're gonna see first in much of the city before we start seeing people conduct, uh, you know, construct triplexes and fourplexes. So um, I don't want to put any more constraints on that than are necessary. Uh, and I would suggest adding that kind of, a, that kind of language. Um, I forwarded it to, uh, to Jackie and to Joy and uh, you may be able to get a copy of that language from them. Thank you, Commissioner Milch. We can, um, we I think that might have been my oversight. Um, I'll look for the email. Um, and if I don't see it, I'll reach out to Jackie and Joy, make sure that 
um, one of those options is included for uh, the Planning Commission's consideration. Thank you, Sue. If there aren't any more questions, I would love to move on to agenda item number four, please. That's an update. Downtime revitalization. Yeah. Uh, yeah, this is John with MIG again. Um, we had intended to have a presentation uh, to share with you on where that process is. And we decided uh, last minute to uh, pull the presentation due to the comments we received yesterday from DLCD to spend more time discussing okay. that if we need it. So if possible, um, in speaking with staff, I, I, I suggest that uh, we provide that presentation on where we are with that process at a uh, uh, later planning commission meeting. Okay, thank you very much, John. Um, I would like to move forward with uh, business from the commissioners and please keep it specific to the Planning Commission. Commissioner Mercero, do you have any comments? Uh, I just wanted to make a note to the council that as far as the uh, uh, sidewalk issue, I, I, I fall in with with the group here to, to work that issue. Uh, and it sounds like in most cases, it, it won't be a huge problem by any means, but I'm with you. Do you have anything, any other business you'd like to share with the commission? Not at this time. Commissioner Milch. I would just want to say that I noticed in one of the packets we got a couple of meetings ago, I think that included a lot of notes back and forth between the folks at MIG and our uh, uh, county planner um, that, uh, and I think I've said it before, I'll say it again. We are blessed with uh, Enjoy Fields uh, with someone who is really knowledgeable about our local codes and who raises good issues and has uh, quick answers to questions uh, some complex issues. So uh, just a word of gratitude to Joy for your assistance in this, pro in this uh, process. Uh, we knew we were getting the best in MIG when we selected them, and we have seen evidence of that here, and uh, we appreciate you too. So uh, this is a complex issue coming down to us from on high, and we are accepting that responsibility gratefully and getting good support in doing it. So uh, thank you to all of you. Commissioner Labonte. Thankful that we're all here, frankly, and that we hopefully can continue this. It's nice to see everybody. Uh, and even, even you, Commissioner Langston, um, very good or via Zoom. Um, so I'm excited for the city. I'm excited for this board. And I wanna thank you all for being here. That's it. Commissioner Volbada. Well done. <laughs> Thank you. I have no more more comments at this time. Okay. Commissioner Langston. I just want to remind everybody, uh, whoever might see this later too, that uh, the Meldrum Bar Park Site Plan Survey 2 is online. Everybody should go and give their feedback so we can have a beautiful park. That's an excellent recommendation. Um, I have a couple of things. Um, I want to share with uh, all the commissioners that uh, Commissioner Poole, um, has resigned his position. So we are going to have a, a vacant seat. So if you know anybody that might be interested in serving on the planning commission that has some good background, by all means, have them go to the website and fill out an application and submit it for consideration. Um, I think that's about all I have for this evening. Um, I would entertain a motion to adjourn the meeting. Commissioner Langston, I make a motion to uh, adjourn our meeting. I'll second the motion. Okay, Tammy, will you do a roll call vote, please? Commissioner Langston. Yes. Commissioner Milch. Yes. Commissioner Labonte. Yes. Commissioner Mercero. Yes. Commissioner Volbada. Yes. Chair Smith. Yes, I adjourn the meeting at 8.08. Thank you very much.